Okay, yes. Hari. Great. So, hi, hello, everyone. Good day, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of today, 18th of February 2021. Uh, we are delighted, uh, pleased and honored to host our dear colleague Thomas Koch today. Uh, I read a few lines about him and in short uh, moment uh, his lecture will start. Uh, professor Thomas Koch is full professor at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT or KIT. He holds the chair of the Division of Geothermal Energy at the Institute for Applied Geosciences and is also head of the topic Geothermal Energy Systems at KIT, contributing to the research field energy in the program, larger program of renewable energies as defined by the Helmholtz Association. Thomas earned his degree in geophysics at the Technical University of Karlsruhe, very close to where he actually works. Uh, he became research associate at CNRS, the National Research Center in Paris, in the field of seismology. In 92, he got his PhD at ETH Zurich. Again, a coincidence, Sebastian, Thomas, myself, also, we are all ETH graduates. Uh, so he got his PhD at 92, in 92 from ETH on his uh, uh, work on investigations of coupled processes in deep geothermal systems. After completing his habilitation thesis, he became senior lecturer at ETH Zurich in 99 as a recognized expert on subsurface and especially in geothermal systems. His code, Fracture, on coupled hydraulic thermal mechanical processes used worldwide uh, was applied to characterize fractured rock in complex subsurface formations. As also co-founder of GeoWatt AG in Zurich, he was the CEO of this ETH spin-off between 2003 to 2011. And that's the year I got my PhD. Here, uh, he collaborated in European and national research projects, also as work package leader, and directed numerous geothermal projects. He led projects in Switzerland, Germany, Hungary, US, and France. At KIT in Karlsruhe, he, a major research uh, focus is on the investigation of geomechanical aspects in fractured systems. As such, the origin and impact of induced seismicity and the impact on the reservoir is of strong interest to him and his team. Using the ex uh, exceptional possibilities of the surrounding geothermal projects, systematic data analysis in combination with the tectonic settings uh, in the uh, Rhine Garben are conducted as well. Graben, I'm sorry, Rhine Graben. With his arrival, uh, KIT became an internationally renowned institute in geothermal research. Thomas has organized several high rank workshops and is uh, one of the initiators of the European Geothermal Workshop organized jointly with University of Strasbourg. Thomas is member of several scientific committees in Germany and France. At KIT, he has established several teaching modules and is engaged in international master programs. Additionally, he's editor-in-chief of Geothermal Energy Journal and Special Issues of Geothermics, member of the International Heat Flow Commission and some other association, including JPGE Management Board member as well. He gave numerous presentations and invited talks at high-level scientific conferences and is author of a lot of reviewed, uh, more than 70 re uh, reviewed manuscripts in renowned journals. He's collaborating with many worldwide industrial projects. Since 2017, he is a spokesman of the working group Geothermal Energy of the German Geophysical Society. He has received several awards, among which I could just list a Henry Rami Award uh, from GRC. It's a pleasure and honor to host you, Thomas. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation. To the audience, please uh, note Thomas' lecture would last for about 30 minutes. A 35 would be okay, Thomas, so don't... Okay, so I hurry up, I hurry up. <laughs> Otherwise, I... Um, <laughs> and I then followed probably... by questions and comments, like always, please do type your uh, questions in the chat box. 
And after the talk, Sebastian will go through them and we'll share a lively discussion session. Uh, thanks once more, Thomas. The stage is all yours. Thank you, Hardy, very much for your um, extensive uh, CV of mine. Um, yes, um, in my talk, I want to provide uh, some perspectives for the future work, for the future uh, of geothermal research and uh, also on the future of how we can participate in the energy transition. That is a key issue here in Europe and uh, will be also a key issue in many other countries. Um, we have developed the so-called Deep Store project um, that should provide these perspectives um, for uh, deep underground storage under the specific conditions that we have in council in the right garden, which are hopefully very favorable. Um, I'm, uh, I give this talk together with Eva Schill, the project leader of Deep Store and the whole of Deep Store team, where we have, a, it would be too much to name them all, but uh, they're kind of uh, eight or ten collaborators which are involved right now in Deep Store. Um, see. Yeah. In my talk, I'm going to cover four major aspects. One is the background of the thermal underground storage. Second then will be the depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs that we have in the upper Rhine graben. Uh, I will then present our deep store project at KIT Campus North and go on the social component that we need to handle in geothermal for future. Now, uh, you may, as an international audience, and Germany typically has a very good reputation on, on its uh, way to go on the energy transition. However, uh, the truth is uh, things are not that favorable as they look out in the presses, as a press. So, um, what is this is the evolution of German energy consumption from um, 1990 to 2018. And you see, you have a very slow transition going on. Only the light yellow part in the top, this is what we call the um, renewable energy uh, from wind or from uh, photovoltaics. There's also a bit of geothermal involved, but this is just very marginal. Anyhow, most of the uh, energy still is on these gray and uh, reddish and black and green colors. And this is what we say it is fossil fuel. Most of it is fossil fuel. For, uh, so this can be either gas, uh, the green one, the black one is petroleum, lignite very bad uh, in Germany, um, and we have hard coal as well. Uh, we have a little bit of this blue one, which is the nuclear energy, but this should phase out um, in a couple of years. Um, and then we hope that most of it will then become yellow. But you see the development is not that fast. Uh, it is a, a, a constant, but it is a, a very slow development that took place over the last years. Nevertheless, up to now we have to face that 6% of the energy that we consume today, so this is power and heat, of the energy that we consume today is steerable, uh, is not fl uh, fluctuating. We have 78% is fossil today, and roughly 50% of the energy of today is, uh, is uh, consum consumption for heat. So you see there's a lot of challenges that the German society has to handle in future. We need, of course, steerable energy in future. Uh, we need to heat up houses in winter when we don't have, um, when we don't have sun. So there is a large scale Really large scale storage systems are required that cannot be handled by battery type systems. Now, when we go the underground, uh, the underground offers these large scale potential. And um, typically um, it's used today. So we have two typical storage, uh, thermal storage system in the underground. The one, one is the borehole thermal energy storage, the BTES system. And the other is the ATIS, the aquifer thermal underground system on the right. When you see this uh, load profile in the center, you see the, this is a load profile over the year from January to December. 
And we have a lot of heating needs in these buildings, for example, in the first part of the year. Uh, in the middle part of the year, we might have a lot of cooling uh, um, in, um, in the building. And then again, to the end of the year, we might have a heating needs again. So the B test system are very favorable and can for small houses. Um, they heat up and uh, allow very high efficiencies, very high seasonal performance factors under the context of this storage. Um, a very f a well known ATIS system is in the Reichstag in Berlin. Um, this is where uh, two different levels. So, what I show here is the upper level. Uh, so, we have one borehole uh, that is covering the have heat. Uh, hot leg, so they inject in summer um, the heat and they produce the heat in winter. And on the other hand, then there's another well where the water is extracted and re, uh, re injected um, just on the opposite sense. So we have these two warm and cold like in terms of this sound of the storage. We will come back to this, to the, these two legs, they are necessary for these systems. Now, the typical ATIS, these aquifer thermal energy storage systems, they have a purpose for heating and for cooling. And um, so currently in Europe, there are more than 2,800 of these systems in operation, um, providing 2.5 terawatt hours energy per year. So this is a big number, an important number, but we have to see that most of these are in very few countries, uh, like in the Netherlands, like in Denmark. Um, where these systems are installed. They are not so much installed here in Germany. And the energy on the temperature level that comes out of these are below 50 degrees C, uh, sometimes far below 50 degrees C. Um, but in terms of the heating needs in winter, when we want to heat up um, district heating systems or industrial processes, we definitely need temperatures much higher up to 150 degrees C. So there's a requirement on these HT, high temperature ATIS system, high temperature equivalent thermal energy storage systems. And this is, uh, and we can also see there are perspectives on uh, these systems require, of course, a larger volume and the larger storage volume you have, the cheaper these systems will get. So if you have small volumes that are involved, uh, like here, uh, they are getting very high costs up to uh, 450 euros per cubic meter. Uh, but the specific cost will reduce as soon as the systems get larger. So there's an economic perspective to create these high temperature hot systems um, in, because they tend to have a lower, um, uh, a lot of savings. These underground conditions are for, there are specific underground conditions for high, high temperature artists. The one is the depth range. The second is the, uh, we need to have, of course, higher ambient temperatures in the, um, in the rock when we want to store 150 degrees C or 130 degrees C. And we need to have a kind of reservoir situation and we need to have large volumes, as I mentioned here. So there are specific conditions on these high temperature artist systems that need to be involved. What we do is uh, we will investigate and um, because Karlsruhe is sitting on this Rheingrab and, and uh, Rheingraben, as I will show you, is, has a, um, is rather favorable for geothermal. And so potentially this upper right graph is very suitable for these high temperature artists. Um, the Rheingraben is an active tectonic setting in the, in the central part of Europe. It's bounded between the Black Forest and the Vosges Mountain, as you can see here. Uh, it is 350 kilometers north south and 50 kilometers east west in extension. And uh, currently, we have several geothermal systems, um, which uh, most of you know. So we have hydrothermal systems, like what we have in Rien, in Basel, in Bruchsal. We have petrothermal systems, like what we have in Sulz. And we have uh, several of these mixed systems in which the fluid can even touch the sediments or the granite um, in between. So we are missing still a wording on these kind of mixed systems.
But we have uh, in the Rhine graben no geothermal storage system. Okay, this is so uh, it is rather new to go there. Um, the upper Rhine graben also is prone to have uh, the, one of the largest temperature anomalies in Central Europe. So below Karlsruhe, we have roughly 170 degrees C in three kilometer depth. So this is a big temperature, good temperature, also comparable to the situation of the basin graves that's been seen in North America. Uh, so uh, it is a, a very prominent temperature anomaly that we have in many parts of the Iran graben. And the border, the geology is, is the cross-border geology because uh, this is a border between France and Germany. And uh, so uh, when we want to have cooperation or when we want to investigate this, we need to have cooperation. Because it, uh, cooperation in academia. So we have a very close collaboration with Strasbourg. We also have it with Darmstadt. Uh, we have also a strong co collaboration with the industry in both in France and in Germany, which is here in the and in the market. Transberg and the ESG, so mostly all these utilities. And um, so what you can see here on the scale is uh, the temperature in 2.5 kilometer depth, uh, which is uh, above 150 degrees in parts of this right ground that we see here. Um, now, we can look a little bit closer to the situation at Karlsruhe. So we have a number of wells at, um, in Karlsruhe, around Karlsruhe, and you see here these black points. They are indicating uh, wells of the so-called Leopoldshafen field. And they are aligned along north-south, uh, close to uh, one of these major faults um, uh, that, however, is not uh, permeable, transmissive, it, it is a barrier. And, and this barrier, the oil, the oil was collected, so it was assembled and uh, was collected through the wells. These wells are in close vicinity to the area of the so-called Campus North in KIT. I will go come later to you, but here you see already it's a, it's a really close vicinity. They are something like three kilometers apart away, so they're not very far away. Uh, we can look a little bit closer here to the situation. Uh, so we are not in the deep crystalline, so oil was found uh, in the tertiary uh, substructures. And uh, these structures were then drilled by many of these wells, and we have the setting of the wells available. So we have individual uh, reservoir conditions at depths um, in which the oil was then drilled and produced from. And uh, the closer you come to the campus, which is here to the right, to the east, uh, the less oil there is. So the more and more water uh, can be found here. And uh, so we anticipate because of the inclination of the dipping of the uh, dipping towards the east, that the oil typically is found here in the vicinity of that fault. And uh, the more you go to the east, the more water you will have. So you have this, and this is also the reason why the boreholes have been drilled here in this area in along one line. So we have potential reservoir rocks that exist at different depths and temperature ranges in the tertiary structures, substructures, in which oil has been produced in the past. Now, um, before going further on this project, I want to, we wanted to look at uh, what is the potential of these systems at all in the Rhine graben. So we have a number of boreholes in the Rhine graben, and this is uh, here shown in, in, uh, in red. Um, these are the boreholes in the Rhine graben between Strasbourg here, Karlsruhe here, Mannheim here. So we have a number of these wells. And uh, the wells that I was showing you before are these small, are these dots that you see here. These are the wells in the vicinity of the campus north. And uh, these, all of these oil fields, they have produced a lot of oil in the past. And this is what you can see here on that logarithmic scale. So some are very small and others are rather large. This is a selected uh, selection of these oil production scenarios. Uh, that go uh, on on these fields. So it is just important for you to know that uh, oil has been produced 
over a period of 20, 30, 40 years in the different fields. And um, the publication is, uh, we have made a publication on this, which is from Kai, and I will show you uh, uh, the results of that publication in the following uh, five, four or five slides, uh, where I can identify, we identify the potential of these, uh, of the upper Rhine graben for high temperature artist systems. And um, first, uh, literature review, we went into the core palm data, uh, they have been measured on, co uh, on cores and the core samples, in the development core samples. And you see uh, we have the typical porosity value go between 15%, 20%, 10%. So these are the porosity values and these are the associated ability. Uh, so the probability looks not so bad. Um, so something above 10 to the minus 15, up to 10 to the minus 12. This is, we find well, there's a number of wells and fields that cover this area here. And uh, this information then was also taken out of uh, our literature data. Uh, we are, could identify 41 wells out of 10 depleted oil fields that uh, showed uh, well, that have been measured and we had here of uh, different reservoir thickness, different probabilities. So we took really everything. Everything that was available was taken in that uh, literature review. And this was not only the, most, uh, the best one, but we took everything that is we could find. And uh, we could identify a very high variability parameter. So as you can Im imagine, the variability um, is on thickness from five to 30 meters. Um, the extension of the field often not very clear, um, but uh, there <clears throat> they are in different depth ranges also found. Um, but the depth range is typically a very ideal, it's an ideal depth range and temperature range for these high temperature artist systems. And um, um, so it's a good basis for a statistical based investigation. So we took these, assessed these data, um, uh, given the variability of parameters. So Kai was then setting up our generic models with the variable parametrization, having two boreholes. The one was a warm leg, one was a cold leg. Uh, and uh, we also assume to have vertical wells or to have a horizontal trajectory. The horizontal trajectory could go roughly 100 meters in the, these horizons and these small horizons that have been exploited. So this is also a typical uh, hydrocarbon technology. So we anticipate that we will in future also use uh, hydrocarbon technology uh, that is available not for GeoSummer right now because of the cost, but once we start up setting up um, these structures, they will be also affordable for GeoSummer. And uh, we assumed a cyclic storage operation where is the summer injection of the excess heat and the winter of the production of the storage heat. So this is the typical well layout. You can see here it was uh, by was it earlier. Uh, a report by Meixner, this is what you can see. So here they inject the heat and the, this is a cooled area from the cold leg that we had here. Now, um, I would like to show you the temp evolution of temperature around this warm leg, around the warm leg. And this is what happens. So starting here, uh, oh, where is it? We should see it here. So this is, you see the different injection cycles and production cycles in the underground. And you realize that the volume of these cycles is increasing with time. Okay, so uh, the more you increase, the more, the higher the volume is that is going to be heated. And this will have also an effect, of course, on the efficiency. So the efficiency of the a system so between the, uh, what is injected and what is produced uh, is increasing. And this is increasing with each cycle in, and we can reach here efficiency of uh, above 80% um, after the 10th cycle. So depending a little bit on the value, it can even could be 90% or it could be 75%, depending on the thickness I will show you. Uh, but we can expect that we have a very good battery. The battery is a very favorable situation. 
So imagine we are have a battery that is improving with time. Every time we're injecting, we're getting more energy out. Um, and this is a very favorable situation of these high these efficiencies. Now, um, <coughs> Kai was going on and this is a different uh, uh, looking for the sensitivity of different parameters <coughs> on, sensitivity, uh, on the efficiency or the system efficiency. So, of course, the higher the well, thicker the reservoir is, um, the better the efficiency will be. So, here in this example, you can, with uh, 20 meters, you can even reach 88%. And if you have a five meter thickness, you can have uh, efficiency with the um, uh, a battery, a battery with, with a battery efficiency of 75%. So this is um, depending on the thickness and of the flow rate here. Yeah? This is, um, of course, the higher the flow rate, the more the more advantageous the situation is going to be. So this is the impact after 10 years of operation. And um, this is the impact of the trajectory. Um, this is very important. I mean, we have here the horizontal wells. And we have here the the vertical wells. Those are just uh, they're just inverted. Sorry. So uh, you should have here the horizontal wells here and the vertical wells here. So they just sorry, they're just inverted in this figure. And you see, uh, there's a big difference. Um, uh, this one is a vertical one. The blue one is a vertical one. Uh, so uh, on low flow, flow rates, uh, they will have. Uh, definitely a lower performance than the uh, horizontal ones. And uh, <coughs> if you have higher flow rates or higher probabilities, uh, you don't see the difference anymore, but uh, in terms of uh, at low flow rates, it's a definitely a very important change. And you also can see what is then, if you take in all the values and look at what is the impact of thickness of uh, probability of, uh, of flow and uh, you, you bring this in in terms of the storage potential and uh, the uh, dotted line here these they are the vertical wells and the straight lines they are the um, horizontal wells and for example if you have here a probability of 10 to minus 13 um, with a horizontal well, you would get something uh, uh, on this specific aspect, you would get something like two gigawatt hours um, per year of storage potential, but going up from the horizontal one, you would then get three times. So uh, the uh, horizontal well is definitely a strong strongly advantageous compared to the vertical wells if we want to use these aquifers. So it's a doubling or trifold uh, storage boost potential if you use these horizontal trajectories. Now we can come back and look, we had all these parameters uh, right in the beginning from this Rheingraben and we have been combining the original data to the findings that we have, uh, either on vertical or either on horizontal wells. And then we can look what is the typical storage capacity in the right ground. And we have been grouping these in all of in, in terms of two gigawatt hours per year. Let's say uh, if we are below two gigawatt hours per year, they are very, uh, they're not very productive. And as soon as you are, we have uh, 10 gigawatt hours per year, they're highly productive. So these numbers are, uh, so we could consider the, the left ones as not, not be very economic, but the other ones could be could become economic. And then what you see is that if you have horizontal wells, you will have a large, much higher storage capacities on horizontal wells than what you will have on vertical wells, given the data situation that we face from the upper Rhine, that we got from the upper Rhine graph in our literature study. Um, there might be cases, of course, where um, you also have uh, systems with uh, uh, which could produce at five to six gigawatt hours um, per year energy, but of course they would the same systems would be much more advantageous if you could go there into horizontal wells. Uh, 
So this is, um, so you see the high storage capacities are linked always to the horizontal wells <coughs> and the lower storage capacities are linked typically to the vertical wells. So there's a need to go into horizontal wells in future. But throughout this study, we can say there is a high potential for heat storage in depleted reservoirs um, in, uh, in the upper Rhine ground. Now we can come to the KIT, um, Campus North. Uh, so if once you have been in Karlsruhe, you wonder where is the Campus North. So Karlsruhe is here with the castle um, and all the uni university is here. And the Campus North is something like 20 kilometers in the woods um, north of Karlsruhe, close here closely to the community of Eggenstein Leopoldshafen. Um, and uh, this is where these wells are, the wells that I was showing you before uh, are oriented here, uh, not far from that highway. We have a lot of uh, sciences in Karlsruhe, uh, which is in geothermal, of course, and geochemistry, structural petrophysics, uh, geophysics, a lot of material science. They are all involved in the, um, <clears throat> in the Helmholtz uh, Association from the university part. But we also have activities out of the campus north in the, uh, which are in the real, so the real Helmholtz part of the, the uh, large infrastructure projects, they are linked to the campus north. And there it is, um, IFA, the EINE, ENA um, Institute, who are working here on site on the campus north. But it's a mixed, it's a big mixture in which campus south and campus north are involved. Um, we have a concession area in the meantime. The concession area is linked here. So this is the campus north in the, in the center of the woods. And we have a much larger concession area in which we have also kind of flexibility if we want to identify different structures to produce from. Uh, so we have uh, a larger, scale, larger concession area that we applied for. The deep stop project that we foresee on this campus is so is linked also to the district heating grid that is shown here on the campus in, in yellow lines. Uh, the uh, borehole will be located close to the entrance of the campus um, on the left. Uh, you can see this also on the right part here. So there's a kind of a meadow, um, a meadow and uh, here is where we expect the drilling to take place um, and uh, at depth of 1000 meter roughly we have different aquifers um, or reservoirs that has been exploited in the past and that we want to use as well and where we anticipate we will have not too much hydrocarbon um, in the wells so this is the concept that we want later on. And you see already here, we have a horizontal well uh, that we anticipate for a future phase. We can have a look on the district heating grid. Wow, I have to hurry up. No, uh, so I will drop the district heating uh, system completely here. Uh, so this is the situation in the campus. Uh, uh, so right now, we, there's a huge energy heat on the campus, um, uh, roughly 50 gigawatt hours per year. And uh, so this is the energy need in winter uh, from January to May. And this is the energy need here in October to uh, December. And you see this uh, in, in summer, we don't need a lot of energy, but we can store this energy. And uh, this is also on time. And a different profile. Uh, so there's a huge capacity capa for the uh, storage for storing this energy. The deep store project is uh, running. It has been approved last year, um, and it is linked to the social, to the social science and social components to the Gecko project that I'm going to show you as well. Uh, we have uh, 2021, the project planning will be finished. I will show you the current results, the overview uh, of the discussion that we have. And we expect to have the permitting uh, for the authorization this year as well. And uh, tendering and drilling could start up next year, so which we hope for a rather fast, um, anticipated fast 
um, development. So currently we are speaking on phase one, which is from 2021 to 2027. And the goal is to show a proof of concept. The so phase two then, uh, so we want to drill and also show that we get the reservoir, the, the parameters that we require. On phase two, we will start with the directional drilling, and in phase three, we will connect the system then to the local district heating grid. Uh, currently, on the planning phase, this is the layout of the phase one. So we will have a monitoring well, and we will have an exploration well that is uh, still slightly inclined. It might not be horizontal, but it is uh, will be inclined in order to get uh, more of these. Uh, reservoir structures in the underground and to be able to investigate these reservoir structures in the air as well. We will have here a hydrocarbon separator at surface and we will have a big surface reservoir in which we can pump in and also produce all the fluids um, as soon as we like we need for the cyclic operation of the system. So we want, we can establish a cyclic operation of the system right through this phase one. So more or less everything that we need and we can also, once we have proven it works, we have done also a proof of concept. The authorization will take place uh, this year. Therefore we will establish and make a seismic network. We have to develop, develop reservoir models and the current research in geoscience is very strongly also linked to literature studies and also on the existing wells. Um, one of the key aspects is what is the impact of the oil content. We have 3D seismic data that we can interpret for this. We have complementary exploration, exploration projects underway, and there are core measurements of on the adjacent oil wells. The future geoscientific aspects will also involve many more aspects like on the the impact of the small clay particles to shale particles the impact of oil mechanical impact hydro testing hydrochemical interaction and the optimization on the drilling schemes so there are many aspects that will be covered in future um in well, the key aspect in always in geothermal right now i mean there's a potential area of conflict so the one is the city and the county of Karlsruhe, they have discovered right now, oh, we have a huge potential of geothermal energy here for production, energy production and for storage. But at the same time, we have these earthquakes that just happened in Mendenheim. We have the requirement for the energy transition and we could potentially save through uh, deep store 15,000 tons here every year. But there's also... Um, we have, on the other hand, we have the reputation of the scientific uh, institutions. We have the public as a stakeholder. Uh, the KIT infrastructure is highly sensitive. Um, we, uh, we have a bad, uh, typically geothermal has a bad reputation, but we have to say we, our project from KIT, we got a fantastic support from the local communities. So even communities that have not been very favorable to geothermal in the past, they uh, anonymously they support our project. So this was really nearly unexpected and the response from this. But we will also continue and work in terms of a social project and link them in terms of this gecko project uh, to them uh, and to bring up a discussion, a joint discussion. So we have to involve social sciences. Yes. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail. So we had experience in Rheingraben on terms of information events that didn't show up very well uh, because the participants have not been strongly involved only in terms of discussion, but we had a different format. So um, this was not a Gecko format. We had a different format from Gecko. Um, and this is a project of Eva, by the way. Um, in which there was a criteria workshop with the conceptual co-design of all participants. And this got a very positive feedback uh, from many people, uh, even from the social action groups, the Bürger Initiative. They all have supported this activity that we have done. And I think we are convinced this is the way forward to, to go uh, and to integrate the local communities in this project. Uh, we also have a concept in how to involve to bring the public into these um, 
two projects in terms of a science for citizens, citizens for science concept. So we will deploy uh, in this context induced. Uh, so we will focus right now on, on induced seismicity or the radon emission, and we will deploy systems, cheap uh, systems at the local people, and we can they can visualize their data and they can. Uh, we will bring the data to our uh, data storage system. We will make a large implementation um, and, um, and bring the return results back to them. So we want to integrate the citizens into the scientific data acquisition. And uh, we are very hopeful that this is working. Also, also can be a kind of blueprint for the future geothermal projects uh, because it improves the quality of the this of, uh, of the project. Now let me go in an outlook. So in future, what do we want? Right now we go on the campus north and we are on a good way to have this aquifer storage, this high temperature aquifer storage here. And this wooden will be integrated in the whole district heating grid here at the KIT. However, there might be still a peak load, a boiler for peak load, fossil fuel or whatever you have. But um, typically this one should provide five gigawatt hours thermal per year. Uh, one system will be scaled up, um, up to, uh, if we could have several of these systems at the campus um, that could supply an important margin or a portion uh, of, the, of the energy. And we also could think of, I mean, uh, having a geothermal production at low rate, at, uh, which is not critical on uh, seismicity um, and so this could go also as base load <coughs> on the whole year, but this uh, the energy from that geothermal production from deeper parts can then be re-injected in summer also into these um, one kilometer deep aquifers and reproduced together in winter. So uh, this also could improve the performance of the of the geothermal. So we have then can link two uncritical geothermal plants uh, without creating earthquakes um, in this context. So, but right now we are speaking on this one and then stepwise on these different phases that I've been showing, we can also go into a ne next stage of geothermal development at the campus. Let me conclude. With DeepStore, we are on the way to demonstrate uh, technical feasibility from literature. It looks very good. So we are convinced that we can get it. However, the local condition at the campus are still known and we hope for the best uh, when we start drilling our project. Uh, it will be a new type of geothermal utilization that can be upscaled for the real needs. So we can have then several of these systems, of course, uh, on the campus. It is a good way to bring up acceptability of geothermal technology uh, because these reservoirs has been exploited in the past without harming anybody uh, through 50, 40, 50 years. And uh, if we say, so right now we don't want to produce oil anymore, but we will produce fluids. Well, this is something, an argument that people can understand and might hopefully also accept much better than going into these artificial systems. And we are not under economic pressure. This is also important. We have a, a research project that we can run at different flow rates and different pressure changes. So even if it fails, it is, it's a failure of a scientific project. It's not a failure of a whole economic structure. So we can stepwise develop our technology and um, we can also stepwise integrate the surrounding communities once we get success. Uh, there are plenty of scientific challenges. You might have heard that the Rheingraben is prone to have a high lithium content for the batteries. Uh, we have, can develop new monitoring cell concepts. We have material coating, corrosion, everything can take place and can be investigated. So it will involve many research um, researchers from KIT, from material science, from uh, 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 engineering, from mechanical engineering, um, that will be integrated into our project. So, um, and there is, we have created um, a startup for the energy transition at the campus and that has a very high um, expectation, let's say, on the directorate of KIT and also from the involved scientists.
So I want to stay and stop here. I think I'm a little Thank late. You. But Thank you. But that the story was so engaging. We, we all enjoyed uh, your lecture. And it's really great to hear that you're not only considering technical aspects, but also societal aspects and acceptability and bringing the science to the society, which is quite an important uh, move. Uh, and I see that in scientific community every day more than before. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Sebastian. We have plenty of questions already posted. So okay, we are so I will stop questions. here. The, uh... Yes, you could. Uh, yes, you could, please. And then we would have the Sebastian, please. Yes, thank you very much, Thomas. A really interesting talk. Um, first of all, it's great to see we have a little um, ETH alumni association meeting here. Um, it's really great to see that that presentation. I think it's fascinating is that KT have taken had the courage to actually set up such a project, lead out on this, and um, it's going to be a huge benefit also for other universities. Um, Plenty of questions. One I'm particularly interested in, and just trying to find first one because I thought it'd be nice to have this in the UK as well. Um, so Yuang asked, thank you for the interesting talk. I'm wondering how feasible the subsurface heat energy storage in other countries um, is in, in other countries in Europe would be. So is sure. it something that just works in the Rheingraben, or can I um, sharpen my pencils and write a grant application in the UK as well? It will work. I mean, we are um, the advantage of storage is that you don't need to have the same conditions as for production. I mean, you just simply should not be far off in your uh, temperature field on the, I mean, maybe 30, 40 degrees uh, below the maximum storage uh, stored temperature. But uh, um, everything de will depend on the hydraulic uh, parameters, but you don't need to have large faults you know you can have a, a high, a high probable uh, reservoir lenses or uh, with defined extension this is what you can have so you're not you have need to have different uh, subsurface structures and there was we can also extend the application applicability of uh, geothermal projects thank you so I'm going to stay on the topic of the subsurface characterization. There are quite a few questions um, that sort of touch upon this. And we start again to Yuang um, followed up with this question, Christine and others, um, and bring those questions up um, one by one. So Yuang said, how much should we know about the characteristics of, of the reservoir for energy storage option? Um, what are the sort of important points that would make a successful project? And I just you know, more much. Um, Sorry, moment asked very similar questions. Said how how would you describe an ideal storage site? What parameters to look at? And Christine had a very similar question. Said no. Um, what's the impact of heterogeneities like faults that you'd seen in your model? Your plumes evolve quite uniformly. What's the impact of geologic heterogeneity and relative uncertainty on on artists? So what is the perfect storage site? What's the impact of heterogeneity? So um, <clears throat> our idea was when we started up with this concept was that we uh, have plenty of data from these oil fields. And of course, we don't want to go directly into an, an oil field because otherwise we will produce oil. This is definitely a no-go. So we should be uh, in the same situation, in the same setting as the oil production did over the years, but uh, we we're not... Um, we don't need to go into these um, uh, uh, highly faulted systems. We can go into faulted systems. Faulted system can have advent can be advantageous or can be disadvantageous. Can have disadvantages. Uh, the advantages are certainly the uh, higher probability, but a disadvantage might be that the heat is easier flowing away. So uh, there might be uh, these kind of, of sand stone formations that have been explored over the years in hydrocarbon might be interesting for underground storage. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it might be the only ones, but uh, they might be uh, interesting for geothermal storage. They are definitely not suited, in my view, for a large scale production with megawatts of uh, power production of elect electricity production, but uh, they might be suited to handle the problem of the heat 
uh, in urban areas where we have district heating systems. And uh, therefore, we are right now on these, uh, of course, as the modeling is everything is uh, uh, homogeneous as isotropic. Uh, we will get also information on the anisotropy, but I'm not expecting that anisotropy will be a major problem, especially that, I mean, it's more the shape of these lenses that are formed along former uh, riverbeds, um, which have a much more higher impact than faults. The faults in the tertiary is not, I think, in my view, not a prominent feature that we're going to face. So we have to, we are not in Bundsanstein, we are not in crystalline rock. Uh, we are uh, definitely in a different um, lithology. I think one of the big advantages is with heat flow and single phase flow, it's more forgiving, it's less sensitive to geological heterogeneity than tracer tests or yeah. hydrocarbon. Speaking of hydrocarbons, I think it's a nice, um, you said, so we hope we're not going to produce too much oil in your talk. You mentioned this again. So I think that shows how far down we are with the energy transition. If you're just praying not to find oil, I think <laughs> 10 years ago, I would be happy to. <laughs> So, so what, what I actually do, find a nice oil field. <laughs> a concept that we have right now and uh, that we're going to solve is what will happen if we have these two phase systems, you know, uh, and, uh, but, you know, you're injecting, I mean, even if we get out some oil and then we inject water and then we get the next time we get less oil and so on. So it is uh, a kind of uh, a permanent reduction. In my view, it will lead, feel, lead to a permanent reduction of hydrocarbons um, mm. through this each storage cycle that is imposed. You talked about the cyclicity, and there are quite a few questions around what is happening in the in the underground. And one um, so one set of questions is around the mechanical side. So Wilhelmine, says, and thank you for this nice presentation, with cyclicity of the operation, cyclic loading and for stricter measures for safety and due mechanical integrity of the system and follows up is it possible to fracture the system due to fluctuation, pore pressures, and heat stresses? Yeah, I mean, the, we have this, this. This is definitely a, a huge discussion that we have on site. Uh, so there are different arguments, of course, what is the maximum pressure that you can impose, uh, what is the minimum pressure. So what we are doing is we are, we'll we are on the way to develop sophisticated numerical models that support a decision. But finally, this is also something that we have to test. Mm. Uh, so what percentage of the overload pressure or stress um, can be used into for poor elasticity, for example? So what what is the relation? What is a good relation in, in between this? And this will be also a, a topic for for research. Because as you can imagine, I mean, this is a highly sensitive environment at Campus North with many highly precious um, uh, laboratories that should not get any harm. Okay, mm -hmm. definitely not. So we will be very careful um, in these conditions. Luis, and I hope I um, pronounce it properly, thanks you for the great talk as well. And um, again about... Yeah. Sorry, it, it's a Dutch name. It's Vaus. So Vaus, okay. <laughs> like the mouse. Okay, so apologies, Vaus. Um, so thank you. For, again, thank you for the great talk. Um, how about considering the geochemistry challenges? I assume this cyclic heat storage would also need proper geochemical treatments. And Christine had a very similar question. Said, what about the cyclic geochemistry here? I simply can uh, support this. This again, hydrochemistry is one of the key topics that are going to be investigated because we will perturb, of course, the system. We will perturb the system in terms of temperature, in terms of stress, in terms of composition of the fluid also. Uh, and this is definitely a key aspect that is going to be investigated. I just can support this. Great, thank you. And one question, um, it's really interesting from Leda, um, and she again saying, thank you for the great talk. Do heat energy storage options always come hand in hand with geothermal production or could there be other sources um, for the heat, solar, uh, converting solar, wind energy to thermal energy, or um, if you have waste incinerators, for example, that have excess heat, so what other options are there for ATIS rather than just the geothermal side? 
Yeah, so uh, we don't need to have geothermal as, um, uh, <clears throat> for the uh, supply of energy. I mean, uh, we have an excess excessive heat um, on an, uh, energy on uh, photovoltaics in summer. Uh, we have different periods in which we cannot get rid of our energy. Um, this is, for example, if you look um, into the statistics of renewable energy, you only get always get two two different values. The one is the energy that comes on the plug at home, and the other is the energy is going to be generated, and they don't fit together because mm. a lot of these energies is going to be need to be wasted. And uh, before we start waste wasting um, uh, wind energy or we wasting photovoltaic energy, we can transform this into heat and then re-inject the heat. Then we have at least a considerable amount of this energy um, preserved for the winter. I'm going to sneak in a question here myself. And is there anything that would keep us from actually trying to store coal? So I'm thinking in the Middle East. Um, big oil producing countries with um, LNG, liquefied natural gas, which produce excess cold. And there the problem is not to heat, keep yourself warm, but keep yourself cold. So could you use, somehow convert the, or capture that cold um, from some of these big industrial processes in the Middle East, store it on the subsurface and then use it in the summer to um, supply your air conditioning or at least to sort of cool down some parts of your building sector. Is there, is there anything that would keep us from looking at storing cold rather than storing heat? You could do this. There are different concepts. Uh, so when I was at uh, our company, we have developed concepts, for example, in, um, in uh, Pakistan uh, on these kind of issues. But um, uh, I mean, yes, yes, this is definitely a, a huge amount of, of uh, um, a um, huge uh, potential. So I know that the TU Munich is going to work on this. And I think if I can give advice for a strategic orientation of a university, I would advise to go into the production of code uh, from thermal energy. This is, um, I think this has a big impact in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just know from earlier discussions that we had um, that. Uh, uh, Australia is going on this, um, but uh, I honestly I abandon this field at the moment. Um, but I just know it is has an overarching, uh, arching uh, importance. That's really interesting. And we have so one final question again from Christine. Um, let me just pull this up, and I think that refers to the plot that you've shown, where you looked at so sort of the horizontal the efficiency of horizontal versus vertical wells. So this horizontal wells um, tend to be more expensive than vertical wells. Is there a sweet spot for the economics of artists? Yeah, I mean, this is a kind of discussion that we, I think we need to to have this, these discussions. I mean, uh, but you can compare, for example, um, if you go to CERN in, uh, in, in Geneva, Okay, nobody is ever asking how much does CERN cost. It is science. And it is science that is going to be transferred into industrial applications. And we need to have these scientific laboratories as well in geothermal. Otherwise, we will not manage to get it. I mean, even if right now we get into this geosteering concept that is really expensive, but maybe we can convince also uh, industry to participate in these concepts and that they find a, a future market in this, then we can go and we can uh, convince the that these systems can be uh, used more often into geothermal and can become a standard in geothermal. So yes, <laughs> economics is important, of course, uh, but we need to have these scientific projects aside. Um, I think those are all the questions I have here. So um, thank you to our audience for some really good, really interesting questions. Thomas, thank you for great talk. Thank you um, also uh, for your really got my organization of this uh, event. <laughs> thank uh, you. It's definitely time consuming. And I will. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Sebastian, if you allow me to. Yes, of announce. course.
Yes, so thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so I take the chance to introduce our next week speaker. Uh, is going to be uh, Professor Pachili Zita from TU Delft. Uh, Pachili will speak about subsurface energy storage uh, by electromagnetic heating. So uh, stay tuned, happy, healthy until next week, the same time, 4 p.m. European, uh, 3 p.m. British time, 7 a.m. California. We see you all again uh, in the same uh, channel. And by the way, last week we had 1,800 subscribers. This week we have 1,900 subscribers. So we are close to 2,000 subscribers. So that's great. Well done, um, well done. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thomas, thank you. good to see you here. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Bye-bye.